Hey everybody, this is Craig here, and welcome to our first live screencast or Q&A screencast for the Web Design Specialist Program. Uh, glad to have you with us. I know some of you, there, we've got some on the call or on the webinar. I know some like to listen to the recordings based on your schedule, but uh, wherever you find yourself, I hope you're doing well and hope you're enjoying the program. I mean, it's just been meaty, a lot of meaty content, a lot of really uh, meaty technical content this week which may have uh, brought a lot of questions. And so we have a number of questions that were submitted to us uh, that Amanda's gonna go through here in a moment. But if you have questions as we're going through this webinar today, some of you have probably used GoToWebinar or been on many of our other sessions, just go to the question panel, post your question. Uh, you know, This is your time to actually connect live with Amanda who has a wealth of experience when it comes to design and development. So, so use this time wisely, ask your questions, and uh, let's have a good time today. So uh, welcome, Amanda. Thank you, thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to be doing this live call number one with you guys. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the questions you've been submitting since the course kicked off. It's been fun getting to know you guys on the uh, discussion forum and um, yeah, just fun answering the questions. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I love, so feel free to keep them coming um, throughout the remainder of the course. And of course, today we've got some questions that I'm going to cover for you as well. So I guess I'll just go ahead and, um, and dive right in in chronological order here. Sounds good. Cool. So our first question is from Jacqueline, and Jacqueline wanted to know how easy is it to switch a client's existing site to Thesis so that we have more design options than they currently have? I know they would obviously need to purchase and install it, but are there any other tricks involved? Um, yes, yeah, so this is a great question, and to be honest, it's really quite simple. If you want to switch a client who has a WordPress-based site over to Thesis, all you really have to do is, well, first of all, I'm just going to pull up the uh, DIY theme site here. So all you would have to do is, it's up to you if you're going to buy the theme for them and kind of include that in your, in your pricing or if you want to charge the, have the client do it him or herself. That's what I do with my clients. I actually, as part of my process, I get the client to come to the DIY theme site and I instruct them on where to go so they would click on the C plans and pricing button here. And they have the choice between these two options that you guys have all seen this page since you've got pieces installed on your own sites right now. But usually my clients uh, will buy the personal option here because they, at this point at least, um, for the most part only intend on having one site. But if they, if they feel like they're going to want to have lots of sites down the line, then they can always purchase the developer's option. And um, what I actually do is, because when you go through the process of purchasing thesis, like if I was to click register and download here, and I'm already uh, already a, um, an account holder here, and I've already, already purchased thesis, but um, once you actually uh, fill out this form and do your payment, what's going to happen is that you're going to get access to the files to download. So you'll get that zip file there. Um, what I actually do is there's no real reason to get your client to sort of go through this process and then send you the zip file because really it's just the exact same zip file that you'll have access to when you log into your own DIY themes account. So that's just sort of a step you can cut out. Um, so of course the client will have to pay for the, the uh, theme and what I actually do to make sure the client has paid for the theme to kind of like keep things above board since I'm the one who actually is uploading um, the theme to their site. Um, just to make sure everything is good and kosher, what I do is I ask the client to um, send me their welcome email that they get from DIY themes after they've purchased thesis. So that just shows to me, okay, they've paid for the, uh, the theme and now I have, that, that person now has the right to use the theme on their site. And then what I do is I go ahead and I just use the files that I have so the latest version of the thesis theme, and I go ahead and upload it to their site, um, which you would do, just to give you an idea. Got a lot of tabs open here, just one sec. Yeah, so you can just do that pretty easily. This is, in case you're wondering what A Kiss from Paris is, this is a dummy site that I have with a very random name that I use for just playing around and, and trying new functionalities and things. So you would just go under appearance and themes, just the way you guys did, um, you know, a couple weeks ago, and you would go to install themes, and then you would 
uh, just upload the, um, the zip file here using this little upload link. So just to clarify then, what I do to make sure I always have the latest version of Thesis on my computer is I just periodically, whenever I get an email from DIY themes saying, okay, there's a new version of Thesis that's come out, I'll just immediately go to the DIY theme site, I'll log in, and I don't remember, I think my username, apparently it has my password but not my username, let's try this. <laughs> no, okay. Um, basically what I would do is, let me try this in the other browser because I know I have it saved there. So log in. I actually have a really cool password management tool. I don't know if you guys are familiar with RoboForm, but I just have all my passwords saved inside it, and then I can click the button down here. Here it says DIY themes, and it will automatically fill and submit the form for me. So now we're inside the DIY theme site. And if I want to get the latest version of Thesis, I just go up here to download Thesis. And here will be the link in the yellow box for the latest version of Thesis. So I just do this whenever I see there's a new version of Thesis that's come out. And you, you'll get an email from DIY Themes when they have a new and improved version. And this is where, if I click this link, I'll get the zip file. And then that's the zip file that I upload to the um, client's uh, WordPress backend. So that's my method. You don't have to do it that way. Um, but it just saves the client from having to email you the zip file when you could really access it anyway. Because there's really no tie um, between, like it's not like when you purchase Thesis, you get a special zip file that only you can use. It's really anyone can, can use it, which isn't so great for piracy, but that's why I try to um, get the client to send me the welcome to DIY themes email just to prove that they have purchased it because we want to make sure that we're all being ethical and moral in our web design businesses. So. so I hope that answers your question about that, Jacqueline. Um, and you have another question, so another one from Jacqueline. So she also wants to know, she says, with Pixlr, each time I save a file and close it, then try to open it later, the layers are gone. So I have just, so I just have the image that I can add additional layers to, but not change words, for instance. Since it is web-based and free, I assume that this is the way it works, but I just wondered if I was missing a trick with the saving and opening sequence that would enable it to open with layers like Photoshop. I have Photoshop on my computer, but I like Pixlr a lot. It doesn't seem so daunting. And yeah, I know what you mean, um, Jacqueline. The thing with Pixlr that's actually really cool is that it's actually very similar um, to Photoshop in a lot of ways, um, but it doesn't have the vast amount of features so it's kind of like a good way to get your feet wet and it's good because then when later you realize you know um, I want to be able to do more because Fixer does have some limitations then when you do make the transition to Photoshop um, it won't feel so scary anymore because you'll you'll be used to using Pixlr so that's just a nice little bonus but I, I totally hear you on that it, Photoshop is quite the beast of a uh, of a program so to answer your question, Jacqueline, there is a way to save images so that the layers are preserved, and that will allow you to come back and edit the layers individually later, which is definitely a good thing to be able to do. So I'm just going to show you how to do that. So I'm going to open the Pixlr editor. I'm going to create a new image. We're just going to make like a dummy image here. So I'm just going to leave these settings and say OK. And I'm just going to move, I don't think you guys can see this, but I've got my, <laughs> I've got my go to webinar control panel here. I just need to hide it. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to make a dummy image here with multiple layers. So right now we've just got one layer, which is the background. As you can see here on the right side of the screen, it's highlighted in blue. It's its background. I'm going to add a new layer by clicking the little post-it icon and let's do I don't know, we'll just do like a square or something. So where's my shapes icon here? <laughs> I, if this ever happens to you, you're not the only one, because sometimes I stare at these, there we go, and I'm like, what am I looking for? Why can I not see it? I, I must be blind. Okay, so I'm gonna create a, just like a rectangle shape in this layer, and there we go. And now I'm going to create a new layer, so coming back over here on the right and clicking this little post-it icon. And this time I'm, I'll do it, I 
don't know, in pink or something. Okay. So here's a different one, and I'll just make a third one for fun. A new layer, a third layer. Oops, I gotta do it up here actually. Green. This isn't gonna be the most attractive thing you've ever seen, but okay, so we've got three layers there. And if I want to save the image so that I can open it up again later and manipulate these layers individually, i.e. so the image won't be flattened, so to speak, um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to File and Save. And you're going to save it in the format of PXD, which is Layered Pixlar Image. So when you do that, I've got to give it a title, um, Layered Image. When you do this, um, you're not going to be able to immediately use this image on your site or anything because it's not a format that browsers recognize. So this is a good thing to save an image in progress as, and then when you come back in and open it up later, you can then save it as a JPEG or a PNG or, or whatever. So I'm just going to try saving this. I'll save it on my desktop, layered image. And just to show that it's worked, I'll close it. I like to ask this, even though I already saved it, so I'm just going to say no. And then I'm, I'm back to this menu here. So I'm going to try opening it, and we'll just make sure that we can um, actually edit the layers. So here's my image here on my desktop. So I'm going to double click it. It's open up again. And if we come back over here to the right, we can see that there are these individual layers, and I can manipulate them separately. So that's the magic key to that. Just make sure that you save it as a .pxd file and you should be good to go. And let, let's say I was ready to use this on my website now. What I would do is I would save it again, but this time I would choose like a JPEG, for example. And that would be in a format that I could then add to my website with some HTML code or by uploading into a post or a page or something using built-in WordPress um, image uploader. Basically anything I would do on a website, I could do it when it's in JPEG or PNG format. Um, and just a quick note about one thing about Pixlr that um, is not as great as Photoshop is that you don't have as many file formats to choose from. For example, I'm not sure why this is, but Pixlr doesn't allow you to save as a, a GIF file, like it's .gif. And GIF files are widely used across the, uh, the web and often are a better choice than a PNG file. Um, but for some reason, Pixlr doesn't let you use that. Um, I'm not sure why. Maybe it's something that they're going to work on implementing in the future. But um, just to keep in mind that PNG files can tend to be a little bit heavier, as we call it, meaning that it's a bigger file size. So if you have a ton of PNGs on your site, um, then it could slow down the load time of your site a little bit. Um, JPEGs, on the other hand, are slightly, generally slightly um, faster to load than PNGs. But why would you use a PNG instead of a JPEG then? Because PNGs let you have transparent backgrounds. So if you want to have an image that is going to kind of appear to float on the background color of your page, then if you're using Pixlr, you're going to have to save it as a PNG. But if you don't need a transparent background, like it's okay for it to have a white background or whatever background color you set it as, then it's best to choose um, JPEG in general if you're using Pixlr. Just cancel this. Okay, another one from Jacqueline. So Jacqueline wants to know, she says, I added new pages the way Amanda explained with the quick add feature. So I think you mean the, the quick post plugin probably. Uh, but each one looks like a blog page with a comment area at the bottom. I assume that is normal and is just fixed by going into each page and disabling comments, but am I correct on that or did I do something wrong? Okay, so you definitely didn't do anything wrong. That's normal. Whenever you start a new WordPress site, it, it tends to, by default, um, allow for comments on pages. So if you want to turn that off, it's very easy. Let's go back into my dashboard here. This is the, the WordPress dashboard for um, girlsguidewebdesign.com, actually. 
And what you can do is you go here on the left under thesis and then design options. And if you come down here under display options, there's a little item called comments. And if you click the plus sign next to it, you can tick this box to disable comments on all pages. So that will automatically stop people from being able to leave comments on your pages. It will not affect the, the ability to leave comments on posts. So remember the distinction between pages and posts is that uh, posts are what appear on the page you have designated as the blog page and pages are more like static pages like about and services and work with us and that kind of thing. So if you do tick this box and then click the big ass save button, um, the comment box should go away across all your pages. Um, when you do that, I believe by default a message will pop, pop up on that page that will say comments on this entry are closed or something. And I find that that's, there's no need to have that on a page. So if you want to get rid of that little message that pops up, you can then tick this box as well and save again, and that will take care of it. Um, now, if you want to be able to let people leave comments on some pages, but not necessarily all, you can also control the ability to leave comments on pages on a page by page basis. So if that's the case, if that's what you want to do, just don't tick this box. So as is assuming this is not ticked, then there's the possibility to leave comments on every page, but we can turn it off on a page-by-page -page basis. So how do we do that? We would go up here to Pages. And this is a really handy, um, handy way of doing it. So let's see here. I don't know, we're just using a random page. If you mouse over the name of a page and then you see this little link that appears, it says quick edit. So if you click that, you then have the ability to, oh, you know what? I told you the wrong way around. So you can, you can disable it, or sorry, you can enable it, but you can't disable it. So then that would mean that you would want to tick that box back on the design options page to turn them off for all pages, but then you could enable them on a page-by-page -page basis by using this little quick edit thing on the page that lists all, lists all your pages. And once you change an option here, you just click this little blue update button and that will make it go live on the site. And it's also really handy because this um, there's a few other things you can do with this while you're in here. Like let's say you realize you want to change the date of a post to make it appear above or below another one on the blog page, or you want to change the author, or what have you. Um, there are a few little things you can do in here without having to actually go into the edit mode page for the page in question. So that's just kind of uh, handy to know. Okay, let me see here. All right, now we've got some questions from Jennifer. And Jennifer says, I've floated my social media icons, but I cannot get them any closer together. So I have had to make the sidebar 300 pixels wide to accommodate. I've gone into Firebug to look at the margins in between, but there are none. And if I try to apply any, nothing happens. Okay, so I just want to make sure here, because Jennifer, I was a little late in asking you for this, but I just want to make sure. Oh, actually, there's no way I can really go in and look at that. I asked you to email me um, your username and password and stuff for your WordPress site if you felt comfortable, but I would have to open up my email here. So what I can tell you, though, are a few different options for, um, for what might be going on with your site. So it could be, let's just pull up a site that has a sidebar here. So. Here we are on the on my site, and this is the sidebar here, and I think I have it set to probably about 250 pixels or something like that. Why? And if you have images that are floated side by side and they appear to be kind of far apart from one another, um, let me just see here. I'm trying to think if I have a site open that will actually illustrate that a little better. Oh yeah, here we go. This is better. Um, this is a site I recently designed um, for a really cool girl, Emily. And you'll see here in the sidebar, she's got these social media icons that are floated side by side. So instead of them being all stacked one on top of the other, we put three on each row. And um, Jennifer, if you're having a problem getting your social media icons close together enough, then there are a couple of 
reasons why that could be happening. I'm not sure if you placed each um, social media icon inside a div or something like that. If you did do that, then you want to go check the width that you assigned to that div. Um, because if you assign a width that's too wide, it's going to be forcing the browser to appear, uh, to, to display the div at that width. And maybe the width of that div is a lot wider than the width of the image you've put inside it, if that makes sense. So that's one option. So just make sure that you want the width of your divs that contain the image um, to be the same thing as the width of the image inside it, or maybe a few pixels wider or something like that. Um, the next thing for you to check would be, um, this happens to me sometimes and I'm, I'm, I'm always wondering, okay, what's going on here? It's like one of those things that makes you want to tear your hair out until you understand what's happening, but sometimes images will have a lot of white space around them just based on the way that they've been saved. So, um, for example, let me see here if I can do this. I'm just going to save this image. And we'll try opening it in Pixlr and I'll show you. Actually, first, let me go back here. First, we'll use Firebug just to, to give you an idea of the sort of borders, this amount of space that's around these images. So I'm going to open up Firebug here at the bottom right. I'm going to use my little blue arrow selection tool. And I can select various things on the screen and we get this blue border around them. So here you can see I've got this rectangle around the whole social media icon area and that's basically a div that contains um, the uh, images themselves. And then if I move my mouse to mouse over these individual images, you can see there's a blue square around them. So in this case, there's not a lot of white space. This is selecting the image itself. And it's not, there's not a lot of white space around the image, so we can see that the image is nicely sort of cropped in to surround um, the shape of the yellow circle that it contains. But sometimes, I'll show you now what you could have that would be slightly different that might be your problem, Jennifer. So if we go into Pixlr, and I'm going to, I'll just close this, and I'm going to open that Facebook image that I just saved to my desktop. So here's a Facebook image, and what you might find is that your image, I'm going to show you what it looks like if I increase the canvas size of this, and that's going to increase the amount of space around the yellow circle. So right now the can canvas is 72 pixels wide and 72 pixels high, but maybe I want to make it, I don't know, let's see here, what's the normal amount. That's not going to look too ridiculous. Let's try 120 and 120. So it will still be a square, um, but it's going to be wider. Now, here you've got these options here for anchor, and that will be kind of like the point from which the canvas will grow, if that makes sense. So if I choose this one at the top left, the canvas is going to kind of load out to the to, to down and to the right. And if I choose the middle one, it will sort of expand equally on all sides. So I'm just going to click OK. And as you can see here, we now have a bigger canvas surrounding the yellow circle. I'm just going to close my, <laughs> my blind here. I have blinding sun coming in at me. OK, there we go. So it's possible, Jennifer, that your images have a large sort of canvas space around them. And then if I was to save this image, as like a PNG or a JPEG or something and then add it to my site, the browser would would take into consideration all this space in the image because it's actually part of the image. So it doesn't know to crop that out or anything like that. So that's maybe a good thing to check. So just open up those images that you have in Pixlr or whatever program you're using and just double check that there's not a lot of um, you know weird space around them. And if there is, you can crop the image in Pixlr and then re-upload it to your web server via FTP. So how to do that, this is the crop tool at the top left of this little uh, dock of tools here. And you can just click somewhere where you want the top left of the image to be and drag down while holding down your mouse button and then release and you'll get these little squares and then I can just click enter on my keyboard and it will crop it like that. 
and then you could save the image and re-upload it, like I said, um, via FTP to your web server. And then you wouldn't have to change anything in the code you put in your sidebar, actually, because it would just automatically know, okay, it's the same file name for the image that was there before, but the image is different now, so it will automatically update. So those are the two things I would recommend you try. And if that doesn't do it, then definitely post on the discussion board and um, we can, uh, if, you're, if you're open to it, uh, I can check out your site if you email me the um, username and password and stuff so I can just go in and see exactly what's, what's going on. And if you wanna do that, you can email me at uh, contact at girlsguidetowebdesign.com. Okay, another question from Jennifer. Jennifer says, I'm trying to change the text in the footer, but I don't know where to look. I can see it in Firebug and I can modify it, but I can't, I'm sorry, I can see it in Firebug and modify it in Firebug, but I can't find in Thesis where to put the changes and save. Okay, so the, yeah, this is one of those funny things with Thesis. It seems like the footer should be by default really easy to, um, to manipulate. Actually, that's weird. I'm just noticing now that like some of my content in my footer is gone. Hmm. Um, let's find another site that's better to show you. We'll use the Rare Birds site. So if I go down to the bottom, this is kind of a highly customized footer that I have um, that I have done for her. <clears throat> and the way I've done this is I've used Open Hook. So by default, what you'll have on a WordPress site is or a thesis site is all you'll see in the footer is this. So get smart with the thesis WordPress theme from DIY themes. But if you want to change that, you're going to need to go into open hook and find the hook called um, thesis footer, I think it's called. So let's look at that here. So if I go into um, let's see here, thesis, oh, I think here I actually have the old version of open hook installed see here. Well, you know what? I actually had some work done on my site this morning and I'm wondering if open hook is now gone or something like that. Weird. Okay, so let's show you on my dummy site, A Kiss from Paris. So if we go to just regular old um, akissfromparis.com, so just visit the public site and not be um, logged in, which we'll do here. I'll show you what it looks like. It's not a very uh, attractive website, but like I said, it's kind of my playground for this stuff. So if we go down to the bottom, got a lot of posts listed here. Oh, and here I've actually once again done stuff to the footer, but I will be able to show you how to do this. So let's see. Inside the A Kiss from Paris WordPress installation, I'm in the sort of dashboardy area here. What I'm going to do, in your case with the new version of, of OpenHook, it's under Thesis. So you go under Thesis and then there's a menu item that says um, Thesis Hooks. But I have an older version installed on this test site, so for me it's under Appearance, but same, same thing in the end. So I'm going to click on Thesis Open Hook, And this, this interface will look a little bit different than what you're used to, but it's exactly the same functionality. So it shows what's available to you in terms of hooks like that you can put content into. So if I go all the way down to the bottom, there's one here called footer. So you have the option here, this little box you can tick. This will be there in the, the existing or the new version of the open hook as well. Um, you can tick this box to remove the thesis attribution if you want to. You're not really supposed to do that unless you've purchased the developer's option because that's kind of DIY Themes' way of spreading the word about Thesis. They have everyone who doesn't have the developer's license, who just has the standard license, um, sort of doing a little advertisement for them in the footer. But if you do have the developer's license, you can tick this box to remove the Thesis attribution, and that is that regular link down here that just says Get Smart with the Thesis WordPress theme from DIY Themes. And you can also add your own content. So here I've put in a bunch of code and you can put anything you want in here. You can put divs, you can put links, um, you can insert images, whatever you want. Um, but that is the key to accessing the footer, kind of the, uh, the sneaky way of doing it. I think they should really make the footer more editable um, by default in Thesis, but I guess the reason they, do, they don't is that they want 
they don't want every, everyone just going in and removing that attribution link when legally they're supposed to keep it there. So that is that. Um, another one from Jennifer. Jennifer says, on the CSS cheat sheet, get a background image to repeat or not repeat. And, and for those who don't know, the, the CSS cheat sheet is um, one of those uh, PDFs, I believe, that you have linked within the course. It says, get a background image to repeat or not repeat. By default, a background image will repeat or tile. Um, and Jennifer wants to know if that means that if you use no repeat as a CSS style rule, will it not repeat? And if you use repeat, will it repeat? So let's look at exactly what this, what this means. And so I'm going to go into the custom.css file for, let's see here, the A Kiss from Paris site. And I've got a, a few bits of code in here. I'm just going to put this at the top, what I'm going to work on here. Um, so when it comes to CSS background images, they do tile by, by default. So what that means is that if you tell, if you put something here in custom.css that specifies a background image that you want to use on your site, um, then it's going to repeat both horizontally and vertically, which is why we call it tiling. You can picture like a kitchen tile, a kitchen floor covered in tiles where you've got rows and columns of tiles. Um, it will do that by default, but if you tell it not to repeat, then it will just show one occurrence of the background image. And you can also specify, do you want it to repeat only across the x-axis or only across the y-axis? So you do have some flexibility here. So let's, I'll show you exactly what I mean so that you can sort of put a mental image to this stuff. So this is a site called Subtle Patterns that I use a lot because it does have some nice um, just sort of modern patterns. Well, let's say we want to use this one. It's called Hexabump. I'm going to start by downloading the file. And now they give you these files as zip files. It didn't used to be the case, but I'll just go with it. So I'm going to save the file to my desktop. It's called Hexabump. And then I'm going to go to my desktop. And you're going to see my scary... <laughs> This is Kali. She's the, the Hindu goddess of destruction. Um, most people who see my desktop are a little weirded out, but I, I wasn't, didn't realize you guys were going to be seeing that, but hey, it's all part of the fun. Um, so I'm going to extract the background image, because I've unzipped it, in other words. And here I have, I open up the folder it's given me. I've got these various files. There's a readme file. I'm not sure what this thing is. Um, but I've got two PNG images. So there's like a, a larger version of it and a smaller version. So that's just a difference in terms of scale of the pattern. So if we look at the scale here, I think this is probably the small scale pattern they're showing here that I'm highlighting here. But there's also a larger option if you want to have kind of bigger hexagon shapes as your background image. So let's say I want to add this to my site. The first thing I'm going to do is open up FileZilla. Oh, actually, you know what? I think this might be a good opportunity for me to show you guys an, another way to upload images without having to use FTP. Because I know that the whole FTP thing, and you guys are not the first people to have had sort of trouble wrapping your minds around FTP, because it's, it's kind of a bizarre thing. It's totally foreign and weird. So you've now, there are certain things you have to use FTP for, like for example, renaming that custom sample folder to custom, which most of you have probably done by now, it's explained in the course. But if you really just hate using FTP and you really just wish you could upload images in an easier way, I can show you how to do that. So let's take advantage of this opportunity and I'll, I'll show you that now. So, so many tabs open here, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload that hexabump background image using this other method. So I'm going to go to the media section here in WordPress. This is one of the items listed in the left um, um, sidebar here. And I'm going to just open it in a new tab so that we can keep the custom.css file open. And here I have three very random images already uploaded. 
but let's say I want to upload my hex bump image. I'm going to click Add New, select Files, and I just got to find that hexabump image. I'll say I like the small one. So here it is. I'm going to double click it. And here we have a few things. I don't really need to bother with these, but I mean, you could if you want to look into what all these mean. But all I really want is the file URL. So I've just uploaded it to my web server, but I didn't have to use FTP. So I'm going to copy this file URL here. I'm going to click Save All Changes. And I'm going to come back to custom.css. So I now have that file URL um, stored on my clipboard. I'm just going to paste it in here so that I don't forget that it's there. And what I want to do is I want to set that as the main background image for the site. So this is the way you do this. Body.custom background image URL. And you can put I like to put single quotation marks. I think that's what I show in all the videos, so we'll just stick with that. But it's actually one of those few things in code where you can not put quotation marks and it will work. Don't know why they designed it that way, but that's the way it is. But we'll stick to using them. And um, let's see here. I'm going to close that CSS style rule. So I'll delete this now because that was just there so I wouldn't forget it. So here I have my style rule that is saying apply this hexabump image to, to the body. And this is one of the few weird things when it comes to thesis where you've got body.custom. It's just one of those things to kind of memorize. Um, but normally you'll just have like a dot whatever, a dot custom, and then dot the name of the class you set up. So I'm going to save this. And then we'll come back to the A Kiss from Paris site and we'll refresh and there you go we have the um, tiling background image here so you saw how small that image was before and by default it defa it uh, tiles both vertically and horizontally now if we want it to do something other than that we have to specify that in custom.css so let's say we want it to not repeat I will put background repeat no repeat as a different style rule here, just listed after the first one. And I'm going to save that and we'll see how that looks. And we're going to refresh. And you can see the only thing left is this little square at the top left because we've told it not to repeat. So we probably don't want that look. So maybe we, I mean, we probably just want it to repeat the way it did the first time I showed you. But let's say, for example, we want it to repeat only along the x-axis, we would put background repeat, repeat dash x. And I'll show you how that looks. Refresh the page. And here we can see it's, re it's repeated all the way along the x-axis. So it's got this strip of them repeating along the top, but there, it hasn't repeated along the y-axis. So this is a good thing to use if you want to just have like a stripe along the top of your site or something like that. That has a more reasonable application that you might use in your design work. You can also change it to repeat Y to get it to give a strip just along the Y axis. axis. <laughs> so if I refresh, now we have a stripe along the left. So to give you an idea, that's the those are the different options you have available to you when it comes to background and repeating and stuff like that. Okay. Let's see here. Now we have a question or two from Andrea. Andrea says, I have a few clients using some of the StudioPress themes, and it looks like Genesis Framework uses hooks. And just so you know, if you aren't aware, Genesis is a different, another premium uh, WordPress theme. Um, Andrea says, okay, so that a few of them use, I see that Genesis uses hooks, my first thought was how much it reminded me of thesis. Anyway, I would love to be able to apply some of the techniques to those, those sites. Um, one in particular that I would like to make the header background transparent. And wondered if you have worked in some of the Genesis themes with CSS customization. And if so, was it very different from customizing it in thesis? OK. Um, I have actually not worked with Genesis at all. It's another popular theme. Um, it does use hooks similar to thesis. So there are kind of two ways that you can capitalize on this whole hooks thing um, similar to thesis. So 
the one way is to actually write the PHP code and you put it in your custom functions.php file, which is accessible here under the custom file editor in thesis. Um, so if you choose that and then edit select this file, we'll see um, this is where you would put your PHP code, but you want to be careful with that because you can accidentally get locked out of your site if you put some code in here that has some, some problems. But one way to customize the um, Genesis framework would be very similar to this, where you're actually writing PHP code and putting it in here, but that's beyond the scope of, don't worry about PHP, I'm not really teaching any PHP stuff. But the way to get around the whole PHP thing with Thesis is to use Thesis Openhook. Now, Thesis Openhook, which is now called the Openhook Customizations Manager, I think is the official name, it does not work with Genesis, to my knowledge. However, um, Genesis does have a um, plugin. Let's see here. Oh, I think I might have lost the URL, but there is a plugin for Genesis that allows you to, and I I had to restart my computer right before we started the call. So what I'll do is I'll find that link and I'll post it in the, the, the discussion board. Um, but there's basically like a, a thesis open hook equivalent plugin for Genesis. So absolutely a lot of the stuff that you learn in this course you could use on those Studio Press sites. You can use Firebug, for example, to look at the code on any kind of site, not just a thesis site. So by doing this, you'll be able to tell the different classes that are associated with certain parts of these Studio Press or Genesis sites. And um, like I said, I haven't used it myself, but I'm pretty sure there must be the equivalent of the custom.css file only in Genesis. So you should be able to use the same methods, just that the names of the classes and things will be different in Genesis than they are um, in Thesis. Okay. Next question is from Andrea. She says, I've seen some websites where the content area was semi-transparent. I would like to know how to make a variety of website sections semi-transparent. Okay, so this has to do with, um, you need a couple of, or three different actually, CSS properties to make this happen. Um, and these are called zoom, filter, and opacity, or opacity. I don't think I've ever said that word out loud. Um, this is an article, what I'll do is I'll post the links that I'm talking about um, in the discussion forum after the call is over, but this is a page that explains how to do it. This is kind of a crazy bunch of code that you don't need to worry about because if you scroll down it says this is what he'd recommend for usage today. So you don't have to worry about this, but basically what you would do is you would apply these three style rules to whatever it is that you're trying to make transparent. So whatever like class or CSS ID that you find using Firebug is what you'd put here. And then you would put this stuff after it in custom.css. Now, this actually sets opacity to be uh, 50%. So this whole zoom one thing, I think it always has to stay as one. But then if you change this 50 to a different value like 30, and then change the opacity 0 0.5 to 0 0.3, um, it will give you more like a 30% opaque look. So um, it would be even, um, even more transparent or sort of translucent, if that makes sense. Now, I will say that the thing with using this technique that is not all that well thought through by the people who invented CSS and that kind of thing, is that um, anything that you make transparent or semi-transparent using this method is going to affect anything else you put inside it in the same way. So if you set up a div, for example, and you say that it should be 50% um, transparency, which is exactly what this code represents, and you put this in custom.css, and then here you put the, the dot and then the name of the class of your div, Everything that you put inside that div, like your text and your, I think your images even, will show up semi-transparent as well. So it can make your text hard to read. Now, there are some ways to get around this. This is an article I found that, which bizarrely has a big picture of this jellyfish, um, that explains another way to do it. So you can use RGBA color, as it's called, and this is the type of code that you would put in custom.css. So I haven't fooled around with this too much myself, but this is sort of a starting point that I figured I'd give you. Um, you can start like Googling 
RGBA color and CSS transparency or something to see what you can do with that. Another workaround that I use sometimes, but sometimes it's kind of just like the simplest things are the best. What I do is if I want to have like a, a semi-transparent box, like in my sidebar or something where it looks like it's kind of, you could see the background color of the site coming through it. Um, what I will do, and actually I have an example of that I can show you. What I will do is, oops. Um, I'll actually create an image. Um, this is a site that I designed um, a few months ago. And you can see here, for example, this blue square. You can see the photo um, through it a little bit. So it's semi-transparent. So this is the kind of effect we're trying to get when we're talking about CSS transparency. But this is actually not done via CSS. What I did is I went into, I was using Photoshop, but I believe you can do it in Pixlr, where I had this um, image of her, this beautiful photo, and then I put another layer on top of the photo, which is this blue square, and then I told, I turned down the opacity on the blue square. So I think we can do that, for example, if I add another layer just to this image here, I'm just gonna make a square, for example. Oh, wait, I was on the crop tool. That's not what I meant to do. Um, a square. It's going to be green. Um, and let's see if I can come over here. I'm not sure if they have transparency. Just trying to find out here. I feel like I've done it before. Oh, yeah, here we go. So if you tick this little... I don't know what this little icon is. It looks like kind of arrows. And if you mouse over it, it says toggle layer settings. So if you tick that, you then get this thing opacity. And you can drag this down. And as you can see on the left over here, it's making that green box less and less opaque. And if I dial it up, it goes back to totally opaque. So what you could do is create an image like that and then set that image as the background for the div, for example. And then you can put text inside the div, and that way you won't have text that um, is potentially hard to read because it has also been made semi-transparent. So I'll post the links to these uh, these articles and things after as well. Um, okay, we also have three more questions from Jennifer. Jennifer says, I like on the websites colatrie.com that the side boxes, etc., have curvy edges. Is this a background image, or is there a way to do this? Um, yeah, so you can see here um, in the sidebar, she's got these white boxes, but they're not traditional boxes. They've got slightly rounded edges. And that's kind of a nice look. It gives more of a feminine vibe to a site. Um, you can do this um, with an image. So you could go in and create an image in Pixlr. Um, let's see here. I believe one of their options is a rounded, yeah. So if I use this little shape tool here, you can see the second option here is the rounded rectangle tool. And I could do this, and it's not, doesn't have square edges. So what I could do is create an image like this. I then want to, want to crop it. I was going to put it in my sidebar because it's pretty huge. I'm using the crop tool to just click and drag the shape I want the image to be, and I click enter. Um, you could then set this as a background image for a div that you're creating um, in your sidebar, and then inside the div again have the text and the images or whatever you want to appear there. But, let's see here, the problem with that, it's not that problematic if you just have like one image or a little bit of text, but we should keep in mind that when it comes to browsers um, and even just different computers, even people on the same browser but different computers, everyone's font size settings are slightly different and some computers just decipher them differently than others. So if you have an image you created in Pixlr with rounded corners and then you're trying to put a fair amount of text inside it after setting that image you created as the background image for the div and then putting the text inside the div in, in a widget, um, you might end up, some people will um, have the text, for example, that goes over the bottom edge of the rounded shape that you created. Now, 
to get around this, you can use CSS to set rounded corners. And what you would want to do is look at something called border radius. That's the name of the CSS property. So let's just show you this quickly. I'm going to go into I'm going to go into my sidebar for the A Kiss from Paris site. So I'm going under Appearance and Widgets. And what I'm going to do is add a new text widget at the top of the sidebar. So I'm dragging that over. And here I'm going to put, um, I'm just going to set up a div. I'll give it a class of rounded edges. And here I'll put in, I'm just going to grab some mumbo jumbo text. There we go. So I'm putting that inside the div and I'm closing the div tag and remembering that I've given it a class of rounded edges. I'll just copy this with, oh, I didn't spell edges properly. <laughs> rounded, yes, okay. So I'll just copy this so I have it on hand to reference in custom.css. I'm gonna save this. And I'm gonna to come to my custom.css file. I'll put it at the top again just to make it easy. So dot custom dot rounded edges. Um, the first thing I'm going to do um, is set up a border because the border radius property that we're going to use um, requires there to be a border. So I'm going to start with, let's see, um, let's do border. And this is one of those shorthand CSS style rules where you can kind of combine different properties into one style rule. So you could put like 2px solid red is telling us a border that's two pixels wide that's solid and as opposed to dashed or dotted. And I want the color to be red. If you don't like, um, if you don't want to use these standard ugly CSS colors, you can of course use the hex codes like whatever you want to put. But let's just use red for the sake of quick example. And what I'm going to do is now add in the border radius property. So border radius, and let's say 25px. It's kind of hard to understand exactly what that will look like until I show you. So let's just try 25 for now, if we can come back and tweak it. So I'm going to click the Save button, go to our site and refresh it. And there you go. You can see here we've now got a border that's rounded and that's red, like we specified. Um, of course, the text is kind of running over the sides, which doesn't look very good. So we probably want to add some padding to this particular div. And the good thing about doing it this way is that the div will just expand to hold the text, no matter what someone's browser is or what their font settings are or, or whatever. So for example, let's try padding Try 10 pixels of padding. And let's say I also want to give the whole area a background color. I can do that too. Background color, let's say red, so that it matches the border and it'll just look like one big shape. Oh, I clicked the image. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Refreshing. And there we go. I mean, it's not, a, it's pretty high contrast and, and hard on the eyes, but you can see here that now we've got padding, so all the text is within the border, and now instead of just having the border with rounded edges, we have a whole shape with rounded edges. So there you go. Um, so again, that's called border radius in CSS. Um, okay, next question from her is, will we be seeing how to move the nav bar next week and how to modify it, et cetera, like putting images in it? Yes, you definitely will. I can give you a little quick heads up on how to do that now if you like. Let me just see here. I'm going to go into the custom file editor for the Girl's Guide to Web Design site because I know that I have my nav bar underneath the, um, the header on that site. As you'll see here, if we go up to the top of the site, there's my nav bar. It's under the header, which is, for the most part, the way I do most sites I work on. And many of you probably want to know how to do that. So. Actually, I said custom.css, but you have to go into customfunctions.php. I'm going to click Edit Selected File. And this is the um, text, or the code, sorry, that does it. So move the navbar below the header. 
um, and it's got a few lines, a couple lines of PHP code. Now, I will paste this code um, into the discussion forum, just so you have it on hand if you want to go ahead and do that now. But just a word of advice, before you add anything to customfunctions.php, it's always a good idea to take a backup of the file, because if you make a little mistake here somewhere, like if you accidentally have, like, I don't know, um, one of these quotation marks that's a curly one instead of a straight up and down one or something, which sometimes happens, then when you save, you could suddenly find you don't have access to your site. Now, if that does happen, don't worry, it's totally fixable. All you have to do is, before you do anything to this file, connect to your site via FTP and download a copy of customfunctions.php. So I'll explain, um, I'll reiterate where to get a copy of that file, like what file path to go into when you're connected to your site using FileZilla. And you'll just want to keep that copy of the file on your computer. And then if you come in here and you make something, make a mistake that somehow locks you out of your site, you can just go back to FileZilla and re-upload the file that you had taken. So the back, re-upload the backup because you know that backup is good. And it will replace the file that's on the web server that has the mistake in it. So just a heads up that that's always a good um, practice with, whenever you're doing anything with custom functions.php to just keep a backup of the last known working version. So it's just a bit finicky like that. Um, yeah, when it comes to knowing how to modify the nav bar, I believe we talk about that next week, but if not, um, there's a great tutorial I can point you to now. Again, I'll put the link. Um, it's on a site called Christarella.com. She's a thesis developer, and she walks you through the structure of the nav bar and tells you exactly what are the different things you can do to it. Um, but yeah, you can just use Firebug to figure out what you want to change. And if you want to add background images to your nav bar items, um, you would just be setting a background image using CSS for whatever those CSS classes are, which you can discover via Firebug and with the help of this article that I'll post the link to. And your last question, Jennifer, is, I notice in the text box, um, okay, so in the text widgets in sidebars, it doesn't let you add HTML to the title section. If I wanted to put a title, I guess I'd just apply some code to the text that I want to appear as the title. Yeah, so what does she mean? If we're in the widgets area here, what Jennifer is saying is that you can't put HTML in this title area. So if I just type title, and click save and then come back to the site and refresh this is where it appears it just says title in, in small caps um, but I can't come back into widgets and put like for example I don't think this works I want to make it bold by using these strong tags I don't think that'll work let's see what happens <laughs> it'll be an experiment refresh yeah it didn't do anything um, and I believe it just see it just stripped out the HTML tags. So if you want to have like a bit of text above the top of one of your text widgets and you want to style it up with some CSS or some HTML, um, the best thing I usually do is I would just remove this from the official title box. And here I would put title and then I would put a BR for a line break. And here, oops, I just closed the tag. <laughs> Here I would encircle it with the tags. So you don't need to, and we'll, show, we'll see how that looks. And there we can see it, it here. Um, and we could center it if we wanted to, or <clears throat> do any number of things to it, make it in a fancy font. But it, you don't have to be married, in other words, to using this title box because it's really just going to be limiting. So sometimes you need to come up with these little workarounds like, okay, well, okay, I can't put the title there and make it look fancy. I'll just put it in the body and in there you can definitely use HTML and CSS, just not in this title box. So that is it. Oh my gosh, I ended right, right on time. That is it for our questions. <laughs> Hey Amanda, that was first of all that was that was meaty. That was awesome. Uh, <laughs> thanks for getting through. Actually, it was perfect timing, wasn't it? Um, can I throw one more question at you before we round out our time today? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. So there was one question that came in as well, just live here. It said, uh, 
this is from Katie. She says, why would I get different results in different browsers when adjusting code, i.e. floats, padding, etc.? Mm, good question. Well, this is part of the wonderful world of, um, of web design and web <laughs> development. All the browsers interpret code slightly differently, which is completely ridiculous when you think about it. But they've been coded, the browsers have been created by different people who had to make the decision to interpret certain things like CSS style rules and certain bits of code in different ways. So you will find that there will be slight differences um, between browsers in a fair number of the things that you do. Now, most of the time, they're not going to be um, you know, things that are traumatic to your design. But sometimes, usually when it's you're testing something in Internet Explorer, you'll find that um, things look pretty wonky. So it's good to be aware, because the Internet Explorer is kind of like the problem child of the browser world. Um, they do things differently than every other browser, and that's why everyone makes fun of Internet Explorer. I mean, at least everyone in sort of the web design development world because they really are not up to speed or not treating things properly. And there are, are therefore a few different, we call them hacks or workarounds, you might need to look into using um, to make your site display exactly how you expect it to in Internet Explorer. So I will post up a link of um, sort of known issues with Internet Explorer. And uh, I'm going to make a note of that here. Um, and basically, it's just something to kind of be aware of, um, especially with floats. Internet Explorer can act a little bit funky. So I'll, I'll post up the link on the discussion board that will let you sort of just keep an eye on things and know, okay, if I'm doing this, I should just check and make sure it looks okay in Internet Explorer. If you don't have Internet Explorer on your computer, um, you can use a site called Browser Shots. Uh, I'll put the link to that too. Let's see browser shots and it basically lets you preview your site in a ton of different browsers like they've got weird browsers that you've never heard of anyone using so beyond just you know Firefox Chrome Internet Explorer what have Safari um, it, there are all these other weird ones so um, that's a great way to preview how it looks all at once without having to open up you know this browser and then open up that browser um, but yeah in general what I try to do is I try to guard against anything that would be really bad with Internet Explorer. So just I check in Internet Explorer. And if there are other little tiny differences, I don't know. Like some people like to spend hours and hours and hours trying to find a way to make their designs look pixel perfect in every single browser. But I think that's an easy way to sort of drive yourself crazy. So I just check for the major things and check with Internet Explorer and just sort of accept that. Um, there are just differences between these browsers and things might look slightly different depending on what you're looking at them with. <laughs> nice. W wouldn't it be nice if uh, all Internet users would collectively boycott Internet Explorer? <laughs> <laughs> it would be great. It would be great. And that's what, you know, people call it Internet Exploder. That's been a joke for many years. <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny because we, when we designed our site, this is back in 2007, um, and we had those browser issues specifically with Internet Explorer. You know, when we were about to launch, everything was good, except for Internet Explorer. So, mm -hmm. so I can feel everybody's pain out there. So, yeah, great yeah. question as well. <laughs> well, good. Well, <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Amanda, for uh, for taking your time to answer a lot of really in depth questions. And uh, I haven't even been talking, and I'm already losing my voice. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> anyways, we are. Uh, we have another Q&A call coming up in a couple weeks. We'll be sending out an announcement for that. Uh, so definitely, um, I think that will come just right after our final week. So I think it's actually September 17th, as I recall my, my schedule. But I'll send that out to you all. Um, so enjoy the rest of the content for this week. we got one more week, and then we'll have a, another Q&A. So thanks, for, uh, thanks, Amanda, for all your time in the social network, too. You've been uh, uh, a, a fountain of knowledge there. So that's pretty awesome. So. <laughs> My pleasure. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. Have a great rest of the day or evening, everyone. And we will uh, see you in the social network and in another Q&A in a couple weeks. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.